In the quiet town of Bay Shore, New York, on a chilly December night in 1982, a girl was born. Her name was Katie Beers. But as some of you may know, that she later came to be known as the girl in the wall. Old spent 17 days in a dark and horrifying underground dungeon. Her life was far from the ordinary childhood one might imagine. It was a life marked by neglect and abuse, a dark shadow cast over her early years. Katie lived with her mother, Marilyn Beers, who neglected her, and her older half-brother, John. Her biological father was a mystery, a figure never identified. Often, Katie and John were left in the care of their godmother, Linda and Guillory, and her husband, Salvatore. But this home was no safe haven. Linda and Guillory was cold towards her, making her do household works like washing dishes and cleaning toilet. She was treated like a slave. Was to do the laundry, to clean the bathrooms, to cook dinner. That was my purpose to her growing up. But the danger wasn't her, but her husband, Salvatore. It was here that Katie and John endured frequent sexual assaults by Salvatore. My life wasn't any better. I was abused by my godmother. I was abused by my godmother's husband and sexually abused by him also, and also neglected by my biological mother. Katie was not allowed to go to school and had no one she could call friend. The closest thing to a friend Katie had was John Esposito, a family friend often showered Katie and John with attention and gifts. I really didn't have any friends my own age. I think in my childhood, the thing that probably made me the happiest was when I got to spend time with John. But behind this facade of kindness lurked a predator. Esposito, who had a previous arrest in 1977 for the attempted abduction of a 12-year-old boy, also sexually abused John. Learned that he had been involved an abduction of a seven-year-old child 15 years prior to Katie's disappearance. John Esposito, not a relative, but a family friend. On December 28, 1992, just two days before Katie's 10th birthday. Two days before my 10th birthday, I was abducted. Esposito lured her into his house with the promise of birthday presents. Big John was probably the last person that I could have imagined having ever hurt me in such a way. For my 10th birthday, it was going to be just Big John and I. After Katie played a video game in Esposito's bedroom, he forced her into an underground concrete bunker. This bunker, a six foot by seven foot concrete cell, was hidden under Esposito's garden, accessible only through a six foot long tunnel. The bunker was equipped with a commode toilet and a closed circuit television system. Inside was a coffin-sized, soundproofed room containing a bed and television where Katie was chained. Esposito had built this horrifying prison specifically for Katie. And then he exposes this hole and he opens up this door into this room. The only word that I have to describe this room was a dungeon, a place that I couldn't escape. For 17 long days, Katie was held captive in this terrifying condition. Esposito would visit her frequently, bringing food, blankets, and toys, but also subjecting her to sexual abuse. He told Katie he intended to keep her in the bunker for the rest of her life. But Katie's spirit was not broken. She managed to unchain herself and escape to the larger room in Esposito's absence, although she was unable to escape the bunker itself. Esposito forced Katie to make a call to make it sound as if she was abducted by an outsider. Oh my God, here he comes. So by the time I picked up the phone to get to talk to her, I, I got nothing. But Dominic Veron, the head of the Long Island Police Kidnapping Division, didn't believe it as statistically 90% of case of abduction calls were mostly the deeds of their own family members. By the time she gets to the machine, Katie had already hung up. That disturbed me because there's been a lot of times when these abductions are not really abductions, they're made to look like abduction. It just struck me as not believable. And I immediately was disturbed by the fact that a nine-year-old child would use the word kidnap. Also, how does a nine-year-old child get away from an abductor and able to use the telephone? To speed up the investigation, the FBI was deployed. We sent the audio tape of that telephone call 
as well as the device that it was recorded on to the FBI. Dominic figured out that the call wasn't a live call, but a recording, as there was no background noise, played at the phone booth outside Spaceplex. And, a witnesses at the Spaceplex amusement arcade also stated that Esposito had arrived alone and was seen using the phone booth on the day Katie disappeared. A scientist at the FBI lab who gave me the next bit of breaking news it wasn't actually Katie who broke free and made that call. It was a recording. It was someone who tape recorded Katie and wanted a, us to believe or well, it seemed that the call came from that telephone booth next to Spaceplex. The main players were Marilyn Beers, the natural mother, a dysfunctional, incompetent mother, Linda Engelary, the godmother. My main concern is to let people know how much I cared for her. She was used by the godmother to run all kinds of errands. Sal Engelary had been charged with sexual abuse on Katie Beers. As per Dominic, Esposito was the number one suspect. There was a police surveillance outside Esposito's house 24-7. The investigators retraced John Esposito's footsteps, but it was 30 minutes to an hour that we couldn't fully explain and appreciate. We obtained a search warrant and did a, a full inspection of John Esposito's uh, residence, but there was no evidence of a crime. Esposito told Katie he intended to keep her in the bunker for the remainder of her life and planned to take a photo of her asleep and send it to police so they would believe she was dead and leave Esposito alone. Although the photo was never taken, as Katie knew if she let him take the photo, then that would be her death sentence. She refused to sleep and avoided eating stuffs that was given to her, as they might have had sleeping pills in them to make her fall asleep. Katie even started questioning Esposito about the future, of how does he plan to keep her here for the rest of her life, to make him question himself of what he was doing. How I was going to like go to school, what I was going to do to survive, I wanted to get married and have kids. And he would always have witty remarks right away like, oh, you'll have kids with me, you'll marry me, you'll do this with me. So I would always tell him, no, I don't want to do that. Pressured by the police surveillance and the continuous bombardment of questions by Katie finally cracked Esposito. After keeping Katie in a horrifying captivity of 17 days, Esposito finally confessed to the police. The door opened and there was a man that I didn't recognize. And I remember them saying, we're the police, you're safe now. I was just overjoyed. Uh, she was alive. You all right, Katie? We were amazed. You see a nine-year-old look like she just come back from a trip to the movie. She's sitting in the sofa, bubbly, upbeat. And we just knew from that moment on that she was going to be a survivor. Finally, the last day of my captivity, I told him that I was sick and I wasn't feeling well. I think between the police department laying on him at his house all the time and my questions finally wore him down and then me saying that I wasn't feeling well finally wore him down so he decided to tell his lawyers that he was the one that had been holding me. After that, I was immediately sent into foster care. After her rescue, Katie Beers was sent to live with foster parents in East Hampton, New York. This was due to the neglect and abuse she had experienced before the kidnapping. Katie was provided with anonymity and raised by her foster parents until adulthood. She began a new life with her foster family on Long Island's East End. She enjoyed what she called a normal sheltered life that included constant therapy. Living in the cozy, toy-filled living room of her log cabin overlooking the Pennsylvania countryside, Beers said her nationally publicized rescue opened the door to a new life with a loving foster. This new life allowed her to play like any other kid, frolicking in the snow in winter and riding her bike in the spring. Today, Katie Beers is a happily married mom. She lives with her husband and two children in Western Pennsylvania. And knowing, I see on my Facebook page all of the time, people tell me what an inspiration I am and how I've helped them. And that is just, that's really the real reason why I wanted to come forward and tell people my story so that they can see that through tragedy, you can come forward, you can become a productive citizen and you don't have to let it get you down. You don't have to dwell on the past. She has become a symbol of resilience and hope her story serving as an inspiration to many. She wishes the same for others who have experienced similar ordeals.
My hope is that I am able to work with different organizations to shed more light on the subject of child abuse and to be able to give victims a voice, whether it's victims from years past that are just getting the courage to come forward or if it's giving little kids the courage and knowing that they need to come forward if something is happening.